In this experiment, I'm going to be doing an electrophilic aromatic substitution reaction on vanillin. This is the vanillin molecule, and I'm going to be brominating it. And the purpose of this experiment is for us to study the directing effects of the substituents that are present on the vanillin molecule. Vanillin has an aldehyde group, which is a meta director, so it's going to want to direct the bromine into this position right here. It also has two ortho para directors, the um, OH group and the methoxy group. The OH group wants to direct ortho para, so that would direct it to that position. The methoxy group uh, ortho para director would send it this way or this way. So we're gonna study what product is actually synthesized in this reaction. If the bromine puts itself um, ortho to the methoxy group, this makes the two bromo vanillin product. This is position number two. Um, so this is one possible product of the reaction. Or if it ends up being ortho to the OH group, this molecule is 5-bromovanillin, the numbering starts at the aldehyde carbon, like that. Or if we end up para to the methoxy group, we would get 6-bromovanillin. These three molecules would be very difficult to distinguish in IR because they have the exact same functional groups present, and that's really what IR tests for. So we're going to be identifying them based on their melting points because they have significantly different melting points. So once we um, synthesize the, the product of this reaction and we're initially not going to know which one it is, we'll measure the melting point of the product and we'll see which um, it matches up with the most. The, the synthesis itself is going to be really straightforward, but before we jump into the reaction, I want to talk a little bit about the electrophile, the bromine. In our textbook, we learned that bromination is done using the bromine molecule in a catalyst like FeBr3 or AlBr3, but the bromine molecule is pretty unpleasant to work with. It's like super toxic. So one alternative to using Br2 and um, FeBr3 is to use a mixture of reagents that will generate the bromine molecule in situ, so in the moment. So what I'm going to be doing is combining HBr, which is also pretty scary but not as bad as Br2, with potassium bromate KBrO3, that's an ionic compound really easy to work with, and concentrated acetic acid CH3COOH. Another term for concentrated acetic acid is to call it glacial acetic acid. This reaction, um, and again, I'm gonna combine all of these molecules together. They are gonna generate three bromine molecules, which are then going to be able to do this reaction. They also produce some potassium acetate, CH3COO with potassium ion, and a little bit of water, it's not really that important that you know about these guys. And this reaction doesn't need a catalyst. So I don't need to be putting in uh, FeBr3 or anything like that. This bromine that's generated is gonna be ready to go. So let's watch the reaction. Okay, so for this one, we're gonna be starting with vanillin, about one and a half grams. Vanillin is the extract of vanilla. So this smells, it smells good. It's just like maybe too much of a smell. and also um, in addition to the vanillin which I'm just going to put straight into this little 50 milliliter Erlenmeyer flask we're also going to be measuring out a second dry reagent that we'll use which is potassium bromate and the potassium bromate is not going to go into the flask right now but we'll measure it out now while we're at the balance Potassium bromate, we need about 0.75 grams. KBRO3. And then, like I said, this ingredient we'll be adding later. That is way more than what I need. Way too much. 
that part out a lot faster than I thought it would. This will add later. Now I'm gonna be adding the glacial acetic acid. I've got 20 milliliters already measured out. That's gonna go straight into this Erlenmeyer flask with the vanillin. If you notice, I've also added a little white magnetic stirrer. This reaction is going to stir for about 45 minutes at room temperature. So I'm not gonna be using any heat on the hot plate, just stirring. The glacial acetic acid is one of the three ingredients or chemicals that are being used to synthesize the Br2 molecule in situ. Remember that's just a fancy way of saying that we're synthesizing the bromine molecule inside this flask rather than putting the bromine molecule directly in the flask. The next ingredient that we need is the potassium bromate which I've already measured out at the balance so I'll just be adding that in. And then the last ingredient is hydrobromic acid, HBr. I'll be using 48% hydro hydrobromic acid, which is concentrated. We need about two milliliters. I do have a really teeny tiny little graduated cylinder, but I'm so bad at pouring into a graduated cylinder that I'm gonna use this disposable pipette. Up to the top there is one milliliter, so two squirts of hydrobromic acid. It's probably going to be equivalent to two milliliters. These little disposable pipettes are not, you know, super accurate, but for me, much safer than trying to measure it out in a little teeny tiny graduated cylinder. So notice that um, orangey color, yellowy color, that's the color of the bromine, which means that that bromine is being successfully synthesized in situ and the reaction is able to take place. So the reaction is complete. I'm now gonna use some ice cold water to start the precipitation process. This large Erlenmeyer flask has some ice cold water in it. I'm gonna transfer our product into this ice cold water. And again, this is just gonna help to start the precipitation. The solution is nice and yellow right now, but if it changes color, I'm gonna add some 10% sodium thal sulfate. If it changes color, that would just indicate that we have some free bromine, bromide ion present and the sodium thal sulfate will help to clean that up. I'm gonna use a little bit of ice cold water to help transfer the rest of the product out of this tiny Erlenmeyer flask. And we'll let this sit and stir for about 15, 20 minutes, monitoring the color during that reaction time period. So as you can see, this is turned orange. I'm gonna be adding some 10% sodium thiosulfate to help neutralize those free bromide ions that are causing the solution to appear orange. The amount that's being added really you know, varies from one experiment to another. The instructions say to just add it one drop at a time. So I'm adding it drop by drop and watching to see the color change. I want the color to go back to that nice pale yellow color that it was initially. Any orange or hint of orange means that I still have bromide ions present. And you can see the color is starting to turn back to yellow. I've also got, if you notice, some brown splashes up the side of the Erlenmeyer flask, so I do need to rinse those down with the sodium thal sulfate also. The solution is, is still kind of orange-ish, but it's pretty close to yellow. I feel like there, that, that looks really good, it looks perfect. So we'll let this finish stirring to finish off that last little bit of reaction time. Okay, we're gonna filter this. Uh, we're gonna be rinsing it with some water, ice cold water that I've had chilling in here for a while. I'm gonna start by getting the filter paper a little bit wet with that water.
this um, continue filtering. It's probably a really fine solid because the vacuum is having a pretty hard time sucking the liquid out. Once it's done, then we will recrystallize it. So this is the crude product, the yellow kind of a powdery, and we're gonna recrystallize it. I'm not taking a mass or anything on the crude product, we're just gonna straight, go straight to recrystallization. So I'm transferring it into this beaker to recrystallize, and on the hot plate, I am heating up a solution of 50% ethanol, that's what we'll be using as the recrystallization solvent. And because this didn't have a chance to dry at all, I want to be really careful when I'm doing this. Uh, I don't want to scrape any of the filter paper because the filter paper is still really wet. And then what I'm going to do is take a little bit of this. This is the 50% ethanol. It's not boiling yet, but it's getting pretty close. I'm going to put a little bit of it in here just to kind of get it a little bit damp so that I'm not putting our dry product straight on the hot plate. Any, any kind of decisions yet because nothing is boiling and you always want to make sure that everything is boiling before you decide to add more solvent. So I'm just going to cover that up to keep it from evaporating and we'll let this heat up. This has been completely dissolved and what I'm going to do next is just let this cool down to pretty much room temperature just sitting here like this and then after it's been cooled down a bit I'm going to transfer it into ice and let it finish crystallizing and then we will um, filter it one more time. These crystals have been sitting in ice and they are ready to be filtered. I've already got the filter paper pre-wet. I'm using um, a little bit of that 50% ethanol solution. In general, when you are 
Um, recrystallizing, you wanna wet your filter paper with the same solvent that you use for recrystallization, uh, and also rinse with the same solvent as well, although we want it to be cold instead of hot. Once these are done filtering, that's gonna sit in a desiccator at least overnight, let it finish drying. These crystals are really pretty, kind of a pale yellow flaky looking crystal. This is our Bromo Vanillin product. It's been drying for a few days in a desiccator. Next, I'm gonna take the mass. It's a really shiny, kind of a beige looking, um, flaky, sparkly crystal, really pretty. very dry so hopefully that means that we're gonna find it's very pure. Our mass here is 1.077 grams. Now we're gonna check the melting point of our Bromo Vanillin product. We're gonna be using the melting point to help us identify the actual product of the reaction. There are three different possible products depending on the relative location of the aldehyde group and the bromine that we put on the ring. The first possible product has a melting point of 155. So I've started the melt temp at 152. And if this doesn't melt by um, 156, then we will heat up the melt temp and try the second melting point, second possible melting point. It's at 154 now and it's not showing any signs at all of getting close to the melting point. When it starts, when solids start getting close to the melting point, they kind of start shrinking and pulling away from the inside of the glass and this doesn't really look like it's changed at all. So I don't think that this is going to be melting at 155. I'll let it get um, a little bit higher. Melt temp's at 155 now, and it, this is solid is definitely not showing any signs of melting. So what I'm gonna do is, um, I'm gonna pause the melt temp. Right now it's heating at a really slow rate of one degree a minute. So what I'm gonna do is reset it to ramp up to about, um, our second melt possible melting point is 166. So I'm gonna reset it to ramp up to about um, 163 just a few degrees underneath that melting point. And it's gonna get up to 163 pretty rapidly. So hopefully it won't melt during that time. Once it gets up to 163, it's gonna beep a few times just to let me know that it's been heated up to 163. And then it'll start slowly heating one degree a minute again. So right now it's almost up to 160 and it hasn't started melting yet. So. I feel very confident that it is not going to be melting at 155. And like I said, the second possible melting point is 166. So if we don't see it showing any signs of melting at all by 166, then we will do the same thing, um, increase the temperature rapidly up to the third possible melting point, which is 178. So this actually looks like it's it does look like it's changed a little bit as I've increased the temperature. Like it kind of looks uh, like it's getting a little bit clumpy. Um, the crystals are definitely changing in appearance. So that makes me feel like it's probably gonna be melting at this 166. 
kind of looks like it's um, shrinking, pulling away from the inside of the, of the capillary tube. So now we're at 163. That beeping was just the machine letting me know we're at 163 and the temperature is going to be increasing now. Uh, and this definitely looks like it's going to be, it's definitely looks like it's near the melting point. It hasn't started melting yet, but pretty close. You can see that inside um, is really shrinking up quite a bit. I do think I see a little droplet that is liquid, so I think the melting has started. It's at 164. Oh, that's happening really fast. Still just a little tiny bit of solid left. And it is done melting. The end temperature is 165.